dernier exposé ce soir est fait par Kanan Sandra Ajan, qui nous parle de la fonction de Liouville dans des intervalles courts. Thank you very much. Um, um, thanks to Nicola Bulbaki for the invitation. Uh, it's a great pleasure to speak about this work of uh, uh, Matomaki and uh, Radzivu. So uh, their work is a little bit more general, but for, uh, for concreteness and maybe one of the most interesting examples, I'll focus mostly on uh, the Liouville function. And this is a function which is uh, very well known in, uh, in number theory, so it takes the values uh, plus one or minus one. It's plus one if the number of prime factors dividing n is odd, is even, and minus one if the number of prime factors is odd. So it's minus one to the number of prime factors. And uh, this function is, uh, is completely multiplicative. Which means that lambda of m times m is the same as lambda of m times lambda of m. And we can ask, what does this uh, sequence of plus ones and minus ones look like? And there's kind of a general belief that this sequence of plus minus ones looks like a random sequence. So just like a, a number of coin tosses, showing up plus one equally often and minus one equally often. Now, of course, this uh, multiplicative property means that it's not strictly speaking random because lambda of six, for example, is given once you know lambda of two and lambda of three. So if you forget you know, details like that, at a, at a very broad level, it does seem to look like a random sequence. So let me give a few examples of what this expectation means and what we can say about that. So one example would be if you take a random sequence of plus minus ones, and if you form the partial sums, let's say xn is plus one or minus one equally often, then the central limit theorem would say that this is on the scale of uh, square root of x, almost surely. So similarly for the, for the Liouville function, we would expect that if you take the partial sums lambda of n, then this should also have quite a lot of cancellation in it. It's equally often plus one or minus one. So this should have cancellation up to about square root of x. Let's say it. So this is the kind of thing where one has to be slightly more careful. So if you're interested in very precise things like the law of the iterated logarithm for the sum of partial sums of independent random variables, uh, this will not exactly mirror the law of the iterated logarithms for that, so far as we know. It will be slightly different. But at a coarse level, if you just want to say we expect square root cancellation here and square root cancellation there, that seems to be true as a, as a principle. But this is not, uh, this is not known as a, as a theorem because this fact is equivalent to the Riemann hypothesis. It's really the statement that this cancels to, uh, 
that for any epsilon positive, you can bound it by some constant times x to the half plus epsilon. So now what we know about, about this statement is a, is a slightly weaker thing. So let me say uh, just qualitatively what we know is that the sum n up to x lambda n can be made uh, smaller than epsilon times x for any epsilon positive if x is large enough. So there is some cancellation in these signs lambda n, but not exactly the kind of cancellation, the square root cancellation that we might expect. OK. Now, another way in which you can expect, uh, you can imagine that a sequence is, uh, is random is to think of, uh, of the signs, and you can look at the patterns of signs that appear. So we know that half the time lambda n is plus 1, and half the time it's minus 1 from this result. And uh, we can ask, what happens if you look at the patterns of uh, two consecutive values of the, of the Liouville function? How likely is it that you get two pluses in a row, or two minuses in a row, or a plus followed by a minus, and so on? So in other words, for every k, you can ask, uh, you can fix a choice of signs uh, epsilon 1 to epsilon k, all being plus minus 1s. And then we can ask how many values of n are there up to some point n, such that uh, lambda of uh, n plus i has the same sign, has the given sign epsilon i. So here the, there's a conjecture which is due to, due to Chawla that we should expect the answer to this to be, the, to be what you would expect for a random plus minus one sequence. Namely, all possibilities should appear roughly equally often. So uh, the frequency of such tends to 1 over 2 to the k as n tends to infinity. Now, or another way to say it is that if you fix that if you fix uh, uh, any k numbers h1 to hk, that are distinct, and you look at the correlation of lambda n plus h1 to lambda n plus hk, the product of these k signs, and if you sum this up to, up to some large number capital N, then this should be smaller than uh, epsilon times, times n if uh, n is large enough. So it's not hard to see that this statement and that statement are basically equivalent to each other if you want them for all, to hold for all k. So one more way in which I can think of, uh, of randomness and this will be the, uh, the topic that I'll mostly discuss, is that if I take, a, if I take an interval from uh, n goes from x to x plus h, so I count k consecutive, uh, h consecutive values of the sign, uh, and then take, make the starting point be arbitrary. So, so start at any random point and then go h steps and then see what this partial sums out. So if I try to do this for, so you can either think of it from the point of view of this Chawla conjecture. If I go h steps forward, all the possible signs will appear roughly equally often. Or if you think directly in terms of a random plus minus one sequence, if you have h consecutive values that are all randomly plus minus one, they should cancel to about square root of h. So, so this should cancel to 
about square root of h. Although what the Chowler conjecture says is that every once in a while, you will have the situation that all of them are maybe plus one or all of them are minus one. Okay? So, so of course, this is a, a, a very, well, firstly, it's very vague, but you can also see that it'll be very strong because it's even stronger than something like the Riemann hypothesis, which only tells you that if you sum a very long sum, then you get some cancellation. And this asks for short sums, uh, maybe something weird can happen there. So this suggests that if you have any interval, uh, so you can ask, when does it happen? that you take a sum between x and x plus h, and the answer that you get is small compared to the length of the, length of the interval that you have. So that in this interval, you have about as many pluses and as many minus values of the, of the Liouville function. So here, think of uh, x as being some randomly chosen point lying between some big number capital X and twice capital X. Okay. So if you believe in some very uniform version of this Chowla conjecture, then one might imagine there's a guess that uh, maybe this is true for every interval provided h is bigger than something in terms of log x to the 1 plus epsilon. So the reason why I say log x to the 1 plus epsilon is that the Chowla conjecture might have you believe that you could take about log x numbers and make them all be plus 1 or make them all be minus 1 or maybe log x over 100 there is a reasonable chance that you should be able to find that just on random grounds. And this conjecture is saying that once you get a bit beyond that log x, then maybe you do have some cancellation all the time. Okay? Now, this is uh, uh, way beyond the reach of uh, anything like the Riemann hypothesis as well, because that will only tell you that you could take h to be on the scale of square root of x, and then you would get some cancellation in every short interval. Okay. Now, or what you might expect, again, based on this Chowla conjecture, is that uh, as soon as h goes to infinity, you might expect that uh, almost all intervals In fact, one has cancellation in the, uh, in the sum of the Liouville function. <coughs> so for almost all, what I mean is that you look at the set of starting points between capital X and 2X, and you look at the number of times this does not happen. The number of times in which there is an actual imbalance in the number of plus ones or minus ones in that short interval, and then you would expect that the number of exceptions is small compared to x. So the number of exceptional starting points x is less than some epsilon times x. So these had been kind of uh, expectations in the literature for uh, quite a long time. And they are also very much connected to similar kinds of expectations people had about the distribution of prime numbers. So 
Uh, the, the result that I mentioned that there's cancellation in this Liouville function if you sum up to x, this is well known to be equivalent to the prime number theorem. The cancellation up to square root of x is related to counting primes up to x with a very good error term, which is the same as the Riemann hypothesis. Uh, the questions about asking for the cancellation in the Liouville function then in short intervals is roughly similar to asking for cancellation in, in the counting the number of primes in short intervals with, uh, with a uh, with a good error term. And, uh, and for primes, people had, uh, had looked at these questions very extensively, and there's been a lot of progress, but it's also been stuck for a long time in terms of how often we can produce you know, almost all intervals containing primes. So it, it was a big uh, surprise when very recently, about uh, last year, uh, Matomeki and, uh, and Radzivil <coughs> proved a, a very beautiful result, essentially settling uh, an almost all version of the Chawla conjecture. So this expectation that I have on the last board, that for almost all x, you have some cancellation if you sum in an interval of length h, as soon as the length of the interval goes to infinity. So let me state this carefully. If h is bigger than some uh, h of epsilon, then what they proved is that you can take the L2 norm of the sum of the Liouville function in a short interval. Now, the trivial bound for this is that this is at most h, and so it's h squared times the length of the integration, which is, uh, which is x. So what they say is an epsilon over the trivial bound. So x times. So, so the result is a little bit more precise than this. But qualitatively, this gives you a good idea of what's going on. And so in particular, what this means is that the number of, uh, number of x, let's say, which is an integer between x and 2x, for which the sum is uh, bigger than some epsilon to the one third times h, say, then the number, the number of such exceptional values of x is uh, at most uh, epsilon to the one third times x. So in other words, for almost all choices of this starting point x, you have some cancellation in this sum. So what's, uh, what's impressive about this is that there's no real assumption on the length of this interval. We don't assume that h is growing at all, except that it just goes to infinity with epsilon. With epsilon. Okay. So previously, a result like this was uh, unknown even on, even on Rh. Uh, the only result that was known on conditional on Rh was a result of uh, Gao, uh, which is a, is a version for the Liouville function of a, of a result of, uh, of Selberg for primes. And here it, it would have said that if you take an interval of the form uh, x to x plus h have cancellation, <coughs> in lambda m, uh, provided h is bigger than some power of log x. For some way. 
Okay, so, so this result is unconditional and uh, holds for, for just any h going to infinity. Now, this, 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 uh, the result of Gao actually will say a little bit more. It'll say that for intervals of this type, you have roughly square root cancellation, uh, square root with some powers of log <laughs> added on, whereas this result of uh, Matomeki and Rajivil, it doesn't give you that kind of uh, quantitative information. All, you're, all you save is a small epsilon, and this epsilon, you can quantify it a little bit more. You could take the epsilon to be roughly like 1 over log h. So in other words, this h needs to be only growing exponentially in 1 over epsilon in order for the result to hold. But it won't give you the kind of finer uh, square root behavior that you might hope to have in general, or which you might hope that something like the Riemann hypothesis would give you. Now, so after this first uh, breakthrough result, there were a number of uh, refinements of their work and uh, with a little bit of progress towards the Chawla conjectures. So let me say a couple of related results. One is, uh, so I mentioned that you know, if you take any pattern uh, of uh, epsilon one to epsilon k of signs plus minus one, we expect all these patterns to appear roughly equally often. We are very far from proving results of that type But jointly with, uh, with Terence Tao, uh, what they were able to show was that if k is 3, so it will also hold for uh, k is 1, or 1 is trivial by the prime number theorem, and k is 2 also will follow from k equals 3. You can say that all eight possible patterns So, for example, it could be the pattern could be plus, 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 or plus, minus, plus, etc. So, all eight of these patterns appear a positive proportion of the time. So, we expect the density to be one eighth for each one of these patterns which we don't know how to prove, but we can at least prove that the density is positive. Over lunch, I learned that in, in France, this is a meaningless statement because uh, uh, I don't mean non-negative here. I do actually mean strictly positive. So, so, so maybe in France, this would be true without the strictly positive for every value of k, not just for k equals 3. So, so previously, it was known that, uh, uh, that all eight patterns appear infinitely often, but we can now say a little bit more about, uh, about how often they, they appear. If you ask the same question with k equals 4, we don't even know that all the 16 possible patterns of the Liouville function in, in length 4, that all 16 patterns appear infinitely often. That's open. So very little is known about the complexity of this sequence of plus minus ones. So that's one result. The second result is, uh, is maybe more significant. So uh, again, due to Matomaki, Radzivil, and Tau. And this gives an average version of the Chawla conjecture. So in other words, uh, the Chawla conjecture says that if you take any, uh, any k numbers h1 to hk, then the correlation lambda n plus h1 to lambda n plus hk, there's some cancellation in that as n goes to infinity. So this says the next best thing. So for every uh, epsilon positive and any k, uh, there is a some number that you could write down depending only on k and epsilon, 
such that if you average over k variables h1 to hk, all going up from 1 up to h, and let's say they're all distinct, and, and now, now you sum So, so the Chowler conjectures would say that this already should be made less than epsilon for any individual choice of H1 to HK. We don't know how to prove that, but with this average, you can show that this average is smaller than epsilon times the number of elements that you have, which is roughly H to the K times N. So, so short of proving the actual Chowler conjecture, this is kind of the, the next best thing. So I should say, you know, one special case of this Chowler conjecture that, I, that we've mentioned here is the conjecture that if you just sum lambda n, lambda n plus 1, then this should be less than epsilon times n as n goes to infinity. And this may be Again, to kind of uh, give the analogy with primes, this might look like some closely related version of something like the twin prime conjecture, just as if you want p and p plus 2 to be prime. But maybe this is a slightly easier problem than proving the problem for twin primes, so far as we know. So, so I'll mostly be speaking about the work of uh, Matomaki and uh, Rajivil, but I should mention here that even though we don't know how to prove this, there is a beautiful recent work of Tao where he showed a logarithmic version of this conjecture. Namely, he looked at the sum n up to n, lambda n, lambda n plus 1, weighted by a 1 over n. And uh, here the trivial bound would be the numerator is bounded only by 1, so the trivial bound would be logarithm of n. And he proved that here you do get some cancellation so this can be made less than epsilon times log n as n goes to infinity. Which is quite remarkable. And um, his result, again, is a bit more general than this. And uh, this allowed him to prove, uh, to deduce, one of, this was one of the more ingredi ingredients in his proof of the uh, Erdős discrepancy conjecture. which is quite a remarkable statement, you take any function f from the positive integers to plus minus 1. So this is just any function, not multiplicative, no arithmetic properties, nothing at all is, uh, is assumed about this. Then the, what, the, what the result is trying to say is that you, if you kind of try to make try to write down a function such that when you average over every interval, you get a bounded sum, right? So maybe plus 1, minus 1, plus 1, minus 1, and so on. Then you would have a problem that maybe on certain arithmetic progressions, so for the alternating ones on the arithmetic progressions mod 2, there would be lots of plus 1s or lots of minus 1s. So what this result says is that no matter how you write down a sequence of plus minus 1s, you cannot arrange for cancellation to happen in every arithmetic progression. So in other words, if you take the supremum over all uh, D and N of the sum on this progression, D times J, uh, yeah. then this supremum is infinity. So it's a beautiful theorem with, with hardly any assumptions at all. No assumptions. So, 
give a, discuss a couple more applications of this work of uh, uh, Matameki and Rajivil, and then uh, in whatever time I have, I'll try to give a very, very brief idea of some part of the proof. So here's uh, one more. Uh, so in all of these results, what's interesting is that it's, uh, the results are more general. than just for the, uh, for the Liouville function. So instead, what you can do is you can consider any uh, multiplicative function f. So for example, let's just say uh, to rest rest restrict ourselves to multiplicative functions to uh, the numbers from minus 1 to 1. But there's also versions of this which would hold for uh, complex-valued multiplicative functions as well. And what, what they say, the result, one of the results is that you can compare the, the multiplicative function in a, in a short interval you take an arbitrary point x, and you go eight steps going from, from, uh, from x, and you want to know what the average of the multiplicative function looks like in that interval. So for example, in the Liouville function, we were simply counting the Liouville function in intervals of length h. And this is, you can think of as some kind of local average. And the natural thing would be to compare the local average with the global average, which is the same sum of the multiplicative function over all numbers from some capital X to twice capital X. So here, once again, little x is chosen to be some random number chosen uniformly from capital X to twice capital X. So, so the prime number theorem the, the idea that you have some cancellation in the, in the Liouville function basically says this global average was negligible in the case of the Liouville function, and we focus just on what this local average was. So the result of uh, Matomaki and Radzivil says that, that this difference is small except for uh, at most epsilon x values of x. So again, this is true once h is large enough. So, so every multiplicative function in, in a small interval around any, around any randomly chosen point roughly behaves like what it does globally. And uh, this allows uh, many other interesting results. So one, one corollary of this uh, is that every interval from uh, x to x plus some constant depending upon epsilon times x to the half contains And into a number, all of whose prime factors are bounded by x to the epsilon. So numbers, all of whose prime factors are below x to the epsilon, are called smooth numbers or friable numbers. And, uh, and they appear quite quite uh, frequently in number theory and, as, and also in computer science in connection with factoring algorithms. So you, one would very much like to know that if you have an interval from x to x plus twice square root of x, then you get very smooth intervals, smooth numbers and intervals of that type. That comes up in the uh, elliptic curve factoring algorithm, for example. 
So this doesn't quite solve the problem that you need there, but it gives you the best result you could hope to get of this flavor. You could get, uh, you know, apart from this value of this constant, it's a pretty definitive result on this, uh, on this problem. And previously, I had proved a result like this, but assuming the Riemann hypothesis, and then this is an unconditional version of that. Okay. So, and one last result is that if you take any if you take any multiplicative any real valued multiplicative function and uh, let's assume that it satisfies two hypotheses that for some prime p f of p is negative And secondly, that uh, f of p is not f of n is not zero uh, for a positive density. Again, strictly positive density of n. So, if these two results are true, then I want to say then uh, f f of n changes sign. a positive proportion of the time. So, in other words, there are values that are, so it can't be that this function looks very, looks a whole bunch of negative values followed by a whole bunch of positive values and so on, and with very few times that it changes sign. In fact, it, it, instead it has to at least change sign some density of the time. And these two hypotheses are clearly necessary because if f of p is positive for all primes p, then of course the function is just positive. And of course, if f of n is zero, except on a set of, uh, uh, of uh, density zero, then again, you can't hope for this condition. So if you make the two natural conditions, then, then the result does hold all the time. So for example, this means that if you take the Hecke eigenvalues of a modular form, and it's not a form with complex multiplication, which is needed for uh, the fact that the coefficients are not lacunary, then this will tell you that the signs of the Hecke eigenvalues, that there will be a positive proportion of sign changes in the Hecke eigenvalues. Okay. So I have a little bit of time to tell you something about the proof of, uh, of this result. Uh, I'm going to focus uh, mainly on the result, which I think, oh, it's still there, which is this uh, uh, estimating this L2 norm of the, of the sum of the, multi of the lambda function in a short interval. So, so the first uh, step is to try to uh, reduce the problem or to transform the problem to, to understanding something about uh, large values of some Dirichlet series. So the Dirichlet series here would be the series lambda n uh, times n to the i y say, and maybe n will go in some interval from x to 2x, and you would like to, un to transform the problem that we have there into understanding something about series of this type on average, maybe, of, with y in a certain range. And uh, this is a pretty standard idea. So this is uh, essentially uh, the Plancherel formula. For, and I can do this for, for, any, uh, for any sequence a n if I try to understand uh, some, let's say something like this. I take a sum over n dx over x. So you should think of this as being 
uh, some short interval version of, the, of what we are trying to, trying to achieve. Uh, so t you might think of as some large parameter, and then this is basically an, an interval of length, of multiplicative length 1 over t centered around x. Okay? And the, 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 the point is that I can compute the Fourier transform of this and just write down the, the, the Planchereau formula. So the Fourier transform So in, for the purpose of the Fourier transform, it's more natural to write down uh, e to the x minus 1 over t So if you think of this function of, of x and compute its Fourier transform, its Fourier transform will just be something like the function, the, the, the associated Dirichlet series A times something pretty easy to understand. Like so. And this is just uh, the sum uh, a n n to the uh, i c. So, so what one sees from this is that you can bound, uh, you can bound this by just the integral of the Dirichlet series a of y squared, and y basically goes up to size t. So let me make sure I get uh, so maybe with this normalization, I have some normalization which is like 1 over t squared here. So or let me write this down for the actual uh, variance in, in, theor in the first theorem. So in other words, what I can say is that uh, if I, I'm interested in a variance like this, so the translation is that, roughly speaking, t is, should be thought of as uh, x over h, sorry, that's 1 over h. Sorry, t should be thought of as uh, h over x. And what I would get here would be, <sighs> sorry, so what I would get here would be an integral from minus x over h to x over h. of the associated gener generating function a of y squared with some normalizing constant here, which I think is uh, uh, h squared over x. Okay. Now, so the point of this, uh, of this, of, of this application of Parseval is that to understand now this variance, I only have to understand what this generating function a of y is and where it gets large. So for example, and a of y here is going to be some Dirichlet series of size. Uh, maybe n goes from x to 2x of some coefficients a n, n to the i y. Now, there are many, uh, this kind of problem of bounding mean values of Dirichlet series appears all the time in, uh, in analytic number theory. So one very easy application uh, of something called the mean value theorem for Dirichlet polynomials will say something like this. It will say that if you take an interval from, uh, let me just say it in this context, from x over h to x over h, 
this is also just a matter of applying Parseval, so it's not uh, very deep, this bound that I'm going to write down. You can show easily that this is bounded by uh, basically x uh, plus the length of this integral, which is smaller than, so this means less than some constant, so times the sum of the squares of these coefficients of am. So if you just uh, plug this result back in here, you haven't done anything because this is using Plancherel to get from here to there. And this, again, is an application of Plancherel. So, but at any rate, you wouldn't have lost anything. The bound that you would get here would be of size x squared. So you would put in x squared as a bound here. Now the net bound would be x times h squared, which is just the trivial bound that we had for the sum to start with. So this recovers the trivial bound. But that might give you some hope But it might give you some hope that one could uh, work a little bit harder to get something slightly non-trivial. So so let me try to explain that in a, in a first uh, uh, simple case. So I'm going to give the first uh, uh, attempt at, uh, at the work of uh, Matamaki and Razivir, where I'm going to assume that the length of my, my sum h is fairly large. So I'm going to make this at least as large as something like uh, x of log x to the uh, three-fourth. So this is a very strong assumption compared to what the final result is, which just wants h to go to infinity rather than wanting h to be this large. So if you're not used to analytic number theory, maybe I should explain what kind of bound this is. This is not as big as x of log x, which is of size x. So this is uh, certainly a weaker assumption than asking, than asking that h is bigger than uh, any power of any small power of x. Okay, so for example, x to the point 0, 0, 0, 0001 would be enough for, for this. And that already was something which was not known in the literature until this work. So let's, uh, let's say h is this large, and, and we want to prove that there's some cancellation in, this, uh, in the variance uh, that we have. So the the idea is that we can, we can exploit something. We have to exploit two things. One is the multiplicative structure of lambda of n, and also the fact that we understand something about what typical numbers look like. So here's another result which is very, which is very useful. It goes back to Hardy and Ramanujan. And, uh, and refined by uh, Erdős and Katz to get a central limit theorem. So the hardy ramanujan theorem says that if you take a, a typical number n, uh, typically has about log log n prime factors. So in other words, the number of integers which don't have about log log n prime factors is a small, is a small number. So it's more precise. It says that if you subtract log log n, then you have a Gaussian distribution with a certain variance as well. But let's just take this. Uh, this log log n comes from basically looking at the sum of the reciprocals of the primes going up to all the prime factors of n have to be smaller than n. So this sum is about log log n. And that's where this expected number of prime factors comes from. Now you can do. Uh, A very general version of this result, 
which says the following. So if you take any, uh, any interval p, or maybe any suitably large interval, and uh, uh, let's look at all numbers n up to x, and you ask, you know, how many prime factors of n uh, in the interval p. Okay, so let me give this some name. Let's call this omega sub p of n. And so this one would just be, this result would be when p is just the interval from 1 to x, let's say. So then the same argument as in the hardy ramanujan proof or Turan's proof of hardy ramanujan would say that uh, that the not, that omega p of n is usually about the sum over the primes in this interval p, one over p, which let me give another name. Let's call it maybe the the expected value, number of prime factors. Let's call it w of p. At least you want to think of this interval p being large enough so that the sum of the reciprocals of these primes in this interval is something getting large going to infinity, let's say. Okay, and then this is true. So what this means is that a typical number, a typical number will not be prime, it will have usually lots of prime factors. And also you can imagine that, that a typical number will have lots of prime factors in, in any, any well-chosen interval. So if you have a sufficiently big interval, you're likely to have many prime factors from that interval, okay? So you want to exploit this structure of what a random integer looks like. And we can restrict attention to basically random integers because in the result of Matamaki and uh, Radzivil, you just want to save a small epsilon over the trivial bound. So if you're, if you're restricting to sets where the exceptional sets already are smaller than epsilon times x, there's no loss in, uh, in doing that. So, so in this first attempt, they, you, can, you can think of their argument as follows. We're going to play with an interval p, which uh, uh, goes from something like x pof log h to the, uh, let's say, 9 tenths to, to h. So this is a slightly larger than x pof, uh, slightly smaller than x pof log h, which is this, this uh, h here. And if you take an interval of this type, then the, the weight w of p, the number of prime factors that you should expect in this interval, well, the sum of the reciprocals of, uh, of, of primes behaves like log log. So this is log log h minus log log of this amount, which you can check is roughly one-tenth of log log h. So this is a very small number, but at least as h gets large, this is going off to infinity. So in this version, what I'm hoping to save is some small thing like a log log h. Now, so, so here what I will consider uh, to in the problem of, uh, of uh, looking at Dirichlet polynomials, I'm going to look at the Dirichlet polynomial uh, A of Y, which is going to be a sum over, uh, so I take this, uh, so I take this interval P and I break it up into, into dyadic blocks. From uh, which look like two to the j. So there'll be the primes in two to the j times to two to the j plus one times the same. So there's about log h such dyadic blocks that are involved. And what I do is uh, I, go, I choose my Dirichlet polynomial to be something like this. 
let's call this, this is pj, and that's pj plus one. Okay, so, so when you expand this out, what are you counting here? You're counting uh, all numbers n, if you expand this out, you'll count all numbers n that can be written as a product of a prime and a number m, and you, count, and you uh, count terms, you group terms with that uh, n being p times m, and these values will go roughly from something like x over two and maybe they'll go up to something like 4x. And they'll have various coefficients involved. And uh, you will be counting lambda is multiplicative, so you'll be counting lambda n times n to the i y, and then maybe some weight here, uh, some weight a of n, let's say. But this weight is, uh, is, is uh, uh, not so bad, at least if n lies between x and 2x, then one can check that what I'm counting here, this weight is just the number of prime factors of m from my interval p. Okay, so it's just uh, decomposing your, your big number, uh, number of size about x into all its prime factors from one of these intervals. And so this a m by, by Hardy Ramanujan, I know that this a m is usually about one-tenth log log h. Okay? So in other words, if I want to understand so if I want to understand this integral from x to 2x, It's roughly the same if, if, as multiplying through by these, uh, by these weights a m, because that's usually just multiplying by this uh, uh, log log h. So you can bound this by saving a log log h squared, and then replacing it by uh, the average over the Dirichlet polynomial that I had. So something like uh, h squared over x times the integral So, so what, I, what I have is a slight flexibility. The first integral that I had, uh, I think I go f until phi after, right? Yeah. So the first integral that I had, uh, I couldn't do anything except use the mean value uh, theorem for Dirichlet polynomials to bound it. What I have here is a little bit more flexible because I've broken up this a y uh, into two polynomials, and I have some flexibility in what, which of these two things I can bound. So the goal is now to bound so I'll skip over some details, but you would have to bound for any j. I'd have to bound something like the integral from minus x over h to x over h. So, well, this lambda p is just minus one, so I can forget about that if I like. So, so this is just, uh, okay. and, uh, and so at least in this situation, you can kind of, uh, what, we re what we've reduced the problem now is to understanding a well-studied object, uh, p to the i y, a Dirichlet series on the primes, uh, for y in a certain range, and the primes p in a certain range, okay? So if you're willing to assume the Riemann hypothesis, for example, you could then plug this in, and you would get a pretty good understanding of what this sum is for a wide range of values of y 
on, these, on the range of primes pj. But even otherwise, you can plug in what we know towards the prime number theorem or zero free regions of the zeta function. So you can plug in the uh, Vinograd of zero free region. And so what so that's kind of what made these, uh, these constants uh, were chosen so that I would be in a range where I could use the Vinograd of zero free region. So, and the Vinograd of zero free region would basically say that, say that, uh, that a sum over p from p to 2p, p to the iy, that this has cancellation provided P is bigger than x pof log x to the two thirds. That's epsilon. And uh, that's what I, so 9 tenths times 3 fourths was chosen to be a little bit bigger than 2 thirds. That was the, that, that was the re reasoning here. So that means that, well, okay, this is true unless y is extremely close to zero, in which case it doesn't have any cancellation, you're just counting the number of primes on that interval. Okay, so forgetting that small point, you could now say that I, by the Vinograd of zero free region, I have a non-trivial bound for this object in L infinity, I can pull that out. Now I'm left with a sum over m in a certain range where I can now use the mean value theorem for Dirichlet polynomials, and there is no loss at the moment in using the mean value theorem because all these primes pj's are still smaller than, smaller than h. So that the length of, uh, of the sum over m that I have is longer than the length of the integral that I have. Okay, so this is the first step in the proof of uh, Matomeki and Radzivil. So, and it'll, it basically uh, goes through very easily to give you a bound in this range but this idea of what a random number looks like, that it has prime factors in any, in any combination of intervals that you care to write down, so long as those intervals have large logarithmic density, that's, the, that's one of the crucial ideas in their proof, because you can now think of maybe iterating this argument by choosing, by choosing at the next stage, not dealing with just uh, one interval of primes, but maybe two intervals of primes, and if you carry out the argument with two intervals of primes, you can basically replace this log x by a log log x. And then you can take three intervals of primes and replace this by log 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 x, and so on. And then once you have an iterative step going, you can then replace uh, any quantitative thing in x by just something going off to infinity. So that's a very quick sketch, but you have uh, a more elaborate sketch in the, in the notes. Thank you very much. A historical comment and a question. The historical comment is that, uh, as far as I know, the Liouville function was introduced by Euler, and uh, Euler thought he proved that summation of lambda n over n is zero. Uh -huh. Actually, he proved it until the assumption that the series converges. And uh, so that, that, that was my historical That's, that's interesting. Comment. I didn't know that. that. Of and course, uh, every object is not named after. So it's, uh, it's in the, the, the big uh, series of articles uh, of uh, Euler and her of numbers where he introduces the uh, Euler product. And uh, so my, my, my question is, um, the theorem you gave, uh, some of them, maybe, can be translated into uh, generalized uh, uh, functions in the sense of Berling. Mm. So Berling considers prime numbers as any sequence of positive numbers larger than one, and uh, uh, generalized integers, simply the, 
semigroup, the multiplicative right. semigroup generated by the generalized prime numbers. And uh, so the Euler theorem was generalized, but uh, for the theorem you gave, I have no idea. Uh, yeah, I haven't thought about uh, uh, Do you mean a, a, a semigroup in the, in the reals or a semigroup in the integers or uh, in the real, so one problem would be, well, okay, so one problem would be that there could be clustering of, uh, of points if you take a semigroup in the, in, the, in the reals. So I don't know how that will play with this, uh, with this argument. I think for the L2 argument, you would really want to consider an interval and take all the semigroup elements in that interval, but then there could be some unusual clustering. So I don't know. I don't know if it affects any of the arguments, but that's one, uh, one point to be wary of. Yeah. It's an interesting question, I don't know. The two diagrams you used, the depth of the diagram is that AO to uh, generalize the Euler theorem to generalize. Right. 